Well, g'day folks and welcome to week number 29 here on our Chronological Bible in a Year Reading Challenge up to a very pivotal point in Israel's story as we're witnessing the destruction of the Northern Kingdom in our narrative. This week we're also reading Psalm 48, a whole bunch of chapters in Isaiah 13 through to 30 and the very, very significant book of Hosea speaking to the Northern Kingdom regarding its destruction and its hope for the future. I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of that. But until then, sit back, relax and enjoy today's tutorial. Well, hi everyone. Welcome to another week of readings for our Chronological Bible Reading Plan. We're up to week number 29, doing our best to read the Bible in a chronological fashion. It's not an exact science, as you know by now. There's quite a bit of back and forth and to and froing, a bit of skipping around here and there. And you're going to notice that again next week. It's not strictly speaking chronological, but we're doing our best to step back Take a breath and give you the big Bible picture of the narrative of the scripture. So far we've seen God's family with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob became a nation under Moses. That nation became a kingdom in the era of Saul, David and Solomon. And that kingdom then divided into two. So we are now in the age of the divided kingdom. However, we are now at a period of time in the mid 700s before Christ, okay, so about seven, 750 years before Christ, we're reading the scriptures that predict and speak of the fall of that northern kingdom, where basically the two kingdoms now, the northern kingdom is destroyed and the southern kingdom remains, at least for the time being. Now, physically speaking, that destruction took place at the hands of a foreign army called the Assyrians, who also try to attack down south, but don't succeed because God's with them. But spiritually speaking, as we listen to the prophets, there is far more than just something physical taking place. God himself is behind this destruction because it is not only the end of a physical kingdom, it is also the end of a covenantal relationship. Last week, we saw that language through Micah and Amos. This week, we're going to read the third prophet whose primary focus is the destruction or predicting the destruction of the north. His name is Hosea, and he is really interesting because he introduces us to the first time to the concept that the covenant relationship God has with Israel is like a marriage. And therefore, the end of this relationship because of her adultery, idolatry is adultery in that marriage picture, because of her adultery, the end of that relationship means God can divorce her and God can oversee her death. That's what's in the law, okay, in the Torah. It says if you have an adulterous partner, you can divorce them according to the law and oversee their death. Well, God does both and describes it in both ways in the book of Hosea, this is my adulterous wife who I send a certificate of divorce. I say, you are no longer my wife. I'm no longer your husband. And I send her away. And he even says over and over again, I'm the one overseeing her death. He says, I will kill you by the words of my prophets. Oh, okay, so don't freak out. Remember, this is God speaking to a people under the old covenant. He told them all the way back in Moses that this is what would happen to them if they disobeyed. So this is really interesting. We need to pay attention because what we're seeing through all the judgment on God's people are always hints of hope. And these things are important to track in our memory because by the time we get to the New Testament, Paul the Apostle comes along and he says, listen, all those prophecies of hope that God said to Israel and Judah, all those prophecies of hope are coming about now in the first century thanks to Jesus. So we need to pay attention to the promises of hope as they're delivered. So far we've seen that even though God has promised to scatter his people from the land, he says one day people will return. The second thing we've seen is even though they have been a split kingdom, he says one day they will reunite one, under one king, one shepherd, who will bring them together in one sheepfold. Promise of return, of a remnant at least, and the promise of a reunification as one kingdom. Well, this week, in light of the fact God has divorced the northern kingdom, he says, don't worry because one day I will remarry you. And so Hosea divorces his wife Gomer, but then goes back to her and welcomes her back 
and gives her a new covenant. God says, I'm going to do the same. I'm going to remarry you in an everlasting covenant. And even though God says, I have killed Israel, covenantally speaking, okay, much like Adam and Eve died relationally when they sinned in the garden and were sent out. So Israel has died covenantally speaking, spiritually speaking to God. He says, don't worry, death, where is your sin? O grave, where is your power? Because I have resurrection power and one day I'm going to see this death reversed. What am I, what's your point, Chad? The point is, amongst all the judgment and the doom and gloom, please pay attention to the promises because those promises find their fulfillment in Jesus. Returning to the land, a promise, the promised land, Mount Zion, okay? Returning to the land, reunited as one. Uh, what's the other thing? Uh, raised from the dead and remarried in a new covenant. And so they're the, some of the promises that we see through the book of Hosea. So enjoy that. There's so much more I could say about Hosea, but I don't have the time. Because the other thing I want to do is talk this uh, today to you a little bit about Isaiah. Now, Isaiah, I hardly mentioned it all last week, and this week we're basically reading almost half of the book, all right? It's 66 chapters. It took Isaiah over 60 years to prophesy those 66 chapters. Uh, it took him four kings to prophesy it. It was a long period of time. We're going to read it in four weeks, okay? But here's the basic things when you read Isaiah I want you to pay attention to. The first thing is pay attention to the time statements. Not all of Isaiah okay, tells us when he prophesied it. So last week, for example, we read the first five chapters, which is all about judgment down south, judgment that was coming and also restoration. And there's a branch from Jesse and all that sort of stuff. Now, none of that has time attached to it. We don't know when Isaiah prophesied that. All we know is it's the first five books in Isaiah, but that doesn't mean it was the first thing he prophesied. Because it's not until chapter six that he says in the year Uzziah died, King Uzziah died, I had an encounter with the Lord and I saw his train fill the temple. All right, that's the first time statement. So it appears that his ministry began in chapter six and the first five chapters are just a collation of some major prophecies that he gave at some point. So keep an eye on the time statements because some of his prophecies relate to the Northern Kingdom before they're destroyed. And then as we keep reading, the rest of his time statements relate to down south when that kingdom is going to be destroyed. So keep your eye on that. Not everything has a date attached to it. The Bible is not set out like we would want it to be set out, all right? We don't know exactly when everything was spoken. The other thing you really need to pay attention to to understand Isaiah, to get anything out of it really, is to really pay attention to the audiences. Isaiah sometimes prophesies to the south, sometimes to the north, but sometimes, especially as you read this week, he prophesies to all different types of nations everywhere. All right, particularly this week, he's going to focus on Babylon, which is right up north, north. Okay, so he focuses. So please pay attention to who the audience is. Don't read Isaiah and just think, oh, wow, I wonder if he's speaking to America. Okay, I wonder if he's talking, you know, to the capitalist America or to the Muslim community or to communist Russia or whatever. Don't think like that, all right? He's speaking to a historical people at a historical point of time, and he basically more or less tells you who he's speaking to. However, having said that, you also need to pay attention to the language because prophets don't follow normal rules, all right? They don't necessarily give their audience every time they speak. And this particularly noted to me this week when I read through chapter 24. Isaiah is addressing different nations. And then suddenly my Bible started saying that he started prophesying the destruction of the whole earth. Now listen, that word earth to me sounds like he was prophesying against planet earth. But in the Hebrew, that's not what the word necessarily means. Yes, it can be translated earth, like in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But it's the same word used in Genesis 12.1 when God shows Abraham and says, I'll take you to the land, I will show you. It's the same word. So the word earth is also the word land. Don't think that necessarily you're reading something that is talking about the global planet. More often than not, you are not. 
Isaiah and the people living two and a half thousand years ago did not have a concept about planet Earth and this massive, never ending, you know, globe. He was prophesying to a particular land. And that really got my attention because as he's prophesying to the Earth, it says the city will be destroyed. The city. So he's obviously talking about a specific land with a specific city in mind. And as you read it, it seems pretty clear he's talking again back south in Jerusalem. What are you saying, Chad? I'm saying pay attention to the audience. Sometimes it's Judah, sometimes it's Israel, sometimes it's both together, sometimes it's foreign nations, and sometimes it is a specific land he is addressing, but it's not planet Earth. All right, so just watch out for that. If you you were to grab a literal Bible, the most literal English Bible we have is called Young's Literal. He doesn't use the word earth. He used the word land. And there are some translation that does that. But anyway, the point is, no matter how much doom, gloom, and despair there is in Isaiah, there are always incredible hints of hope. Restoration, okay, reunification, a highway from the north where people will return to Zion and worship. And this all has to do with some future king who will come from the line of David, who in one point it says is from Galilee, but then it says is also from Bethlehem. I wonder who that could be. All right, so plenty of hope there in Isaiah and plenty of language that you are going to recognize from the New Testament and that's going to be repeated by other prophets, okay? We're also reading this week's Psalm. 48. It's got very similar language. It talks about God's judgment on people and them having pains like a woman in labor. Okay, so I think that's why it's there because we've we've read that example in the language a lot over these prophets about birth pains being a sign of God's judgment upon a particular city that he's, he's judging. And all of this familiarity in the prophets, listen, all of this will help us understand the New Testament. Because as I said before, when Paul preaches his gospel in the book of Acts, he says, all I am doing is preaching what the prophets said would happen. So we need to pay attention to the prophets, please. We need to pay attention to their language because it will help us to understand New Testament language by the time we get there, okay? Hope you enjoy the prophets this week. But it's not all prophets this week. We're also reading four chapters of narrative in the book of Kings. And I'll probably finish there because this is actually really positive. While the north is going into darkness and despair and destruction and doom and divorce and death, okay, all the Ds, while that's happening in the north, in the south, they've got a really good king. They've got a guy called Hezekiah. He is the best king that they've ever had since Solomon. And he is fantastic. King number 12 in the south. And he does a really, really great job. And Isaiah, by the way, is his right-hand prophetic man. So Isaiah does get a mention in the narrative story. Okay? Hope I haven't spoken too long. Bless you guys. Enjoy your readings this week and uh, keep tracking with me because understanding the prophets, as I said, is really going to help you when we get to the first century in the New Testament scriptures, understanding what the heck Paul's going on about when he quotes the Old Testament prophets. You're going to need to see that later on. Bless you heaps and I'll talk to you on the other side. Bye. That's it for today's lesson. I really hope you enjoy your readings this week. Remember, allow yourself time to read as much as you can in one sitting. Don't get lost in the detail. Just keep going and watch the Bible's big story unfold before you. Remember also to hit me up on our social media channels or website, and I'll see you next time.